Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Auto Central, South Africa's number one motoring podcast. My name is George Mini, your host, and I'm joined as usual by none other than Wandile Sishi. How's it, Wandi? Not too bad, George. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Where can listeners find our show? So if you want to get the show first, you can catch us every single Monday at 9 a.m. on cliffcentral.com. Um, but if you want to see our faces, you could also find us on the Auto Trader SA YouTube channel. Um, alternatively, if you want a convenience, you can also find and stream and download the show on Spotify or iTunes Music. Whatever you prefer, you can find us. And don't forget that on YouTube, please just uh, hit that subscribe button, like the videos, and uh, yeah, we'll be with you every single week. Exactly. Thanks, Wandi. So uh, um, in the episode today, um, we're going to ask the question, what is the ultimate all-round, try and answer the question, should I say, uh, <laughs> what is the ultimate all-round vehicle um, and does it exist yeah, today? Yeah, um, yeah. I have some opinions. I think yeah, you probably too. have as well. <laughs> uh, and then later on in the episode, one of our expert journalists, uh, Martin Pretorius, uh, will join us to review the new 2021 Toyota Land Cruiser Prado VX-L. I don't know yep. if I should have said dash L, but we'll find out from Martin whether I should have said that or not later. <laughs> um, and then lastly, as usual, we aren't, we'll answer some of your burning questions from our Ask Auto Trader platform. So uh, getting right into it, uh, uh, Wendy, what is the ultimate all-round vehicle and does it exist today? Because um, in a car lover's world… yeah. We know South Africans love cars. Yeah. Uh, South Africans love buckies, as a matter of fact. Um, the ideal world would be to have a fleet of vehicles to pick and choose from to do depending different on jobs depending yeah. on what's happening, yeah. uh, you know, in your life, um, even when your mood. So yeah. uh, um, the practicalities of doing that, however, keeping a fleet or a garage of cars is uh, uh, is hard to achieve, non, yeah. notwithstanding the fact that it, it would be really expensive. Yeah. Really, really <laughs> expensive, right? Um, so uh, what car ticks all the boxes? It needs to be capable off-road, on-road, stylish, comfortable, and all-rounder. In your opinion, does this exist? So on the way to the studio today, I thought about this intensely. Uh -huh. um, and the short answer for me, I think a lot of people would be like, the perfect car doesn't exist because, yeah. you know, everyone has, you know, different preferences. But I believe that anything can be quantifiable. And I think that you can definitely have a scale where at least the majority of people kind of agree um, and that would make it perfect. So I think it does exist. Well, I mean, perfection is 100%. And if you say majority, well, does Maybe it, not true perfection, but know? I mean, what what are we going to do then if um, everything, I, I think everything can be measured. Um, of course I think it can. it's, um, it's kind of, um, you know, you have to take the subjectivity and the objectivity of things and that would give you at least the closest we can get to true perfection. Well, I think that's where the problem lies. It is, uh, uh, you know, things that you can measure like speed, horsepower, braking distance. Those yeah, are yeah. those are all measurable. Yeah. Um, you know, and you always want the best of those. So you want the most horsepower. Yeah. You want. Well, why would anybody want to drive a car that's slow? Well, it depends. Um, I think my grandmother would have a different opinion to that. Um, and my girlfriend would also say, speed is uh, not my friend at least. Okay, uh, so, so so even if the speed of the car is measurable, yeah. okay, it's still subjective as to whether you want a fast or a slow car. Then so it's perfect even to the, you. Maybe yeah. it's not perfect to everyone, but I think you can find a perfect car. For you, yes. Yeah. But, 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 but does this perfect car exist? And maybe that's why we've got so many brands. Maybe that's why we've got so yeah. many makes, models and variants and the combinations of them and the yeah. different options. I mean, um, you know, I think, I think we as a business at Auto Trader cleaned 11 million records yeah. when we were f uh, fixing our databases yeah. uh, over the last couple of years. 11 million records. Yeah. It's just, um, yeah. That's just insane. Well, then why do we have competitions like, um, you know, car of the year? Um, I think that's, as humans, we have to get as close as possible to understanding what is perfection. Um, for something. Well, isn't car of the year still subjective? Of course it is. But subjective there's, there's to a, a bunch of journalists, subjective mm. to the majority of consumers. So, so, so the subjectivity of car competitions yeah. comes out just in a majority. It doesn't mean that it's the perfect car, does it? But it's based on a set standard, which... The people who, who have sets who, the standard. 
the people who safety I can understand, but yeah. you know, uh, I don't know. I, I I strongly believe that because, for instance, our journalists because they drive everything um, that's on the market, they would know what the benchmark is, and that should be the ruler of the scale where we kind of yeah. But if somebody likes wooden inlays in their dash and a journalist doesn't like wooden inlays in the dash. It's going to count against the car in that journalist's opinion, right? And that's why you have a panel of, 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 of I guess, uh, people who are kind of the journalists or the people who are making these rules. Okay, so I suppose when you add more people to the, uh, to the subjectivity, you get objectivity. Of course. Uh, or not. Right. And that can change. I'm not saying that it's an absolute forever. I think that level, that scale is a sliding scale, which is always changing, depending on the needs of people. Well, uh, you know, do body types then uh, uh, close this gap a little bit, do you think? I think so. Um, So if you you asked me, does it exist? I think it does. And what is it? I'm not sure. But I think um, body types are there to kind of solve for that. So because everyone's different and everyone has their different opinions and uh, of what is perfect and what's ideal, body types kind of solve all of that. Um, We spoke about crossovers last week and was really, really interesting because it made me appreciate it more and think that maybe crossovers are closer to that, uh, that perfection scale. Well, I mean, with the, with the advancement of technology and engineering, uh, you know, cars have moved from this boxy sort of machine to mm. uh, a work of art or a sculpture. Mm. You know, what is the, maybe that's why we have so many different shapes in SUVs. We've got the yeah. boxy type shaped SUVs and we've got the, uh, uh, the more sleek kind of bullet shaped, yeah. dolphin yeah. shaped SUVs. Coupe kind Coupé, of looking, yes. yeah. uh, like, for, like for instance, the BMW X6. Yeah. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. I love BMW, but... Um, and for some people, that's a perfect car. It's a perfect car, right? And that's the beauty of it. I don't think um, it's a, a definite, this is perfect. I think it there's a percentage, mm. at least, mm. when you take the objectivity and the subjectivity and you get a, a score. Do you think the SUV gets us closer? Um, because it's off-road or it's got, it's got some off-road capabilities in most instances. You can go off-road, you yeah. can carry more people. I think it ticks a lot of those boxes. I mean, um, in your girlfriend's cash, you would want a slow SUV. A really slow SUV. <laughs> that's the thing. I think, um, yeah, I think SUVs, that's why they sell so much. That's why they're the fastest growing because I think they tick a lot of the, the boxes that people think of when they're looking for the ideal or perfect car. So the ultimate the ultimate answer, I suppose, then is uh, um, there are so many perfect cars. How do we find the perfect car? Mm. And uh, um, I suppose it just depends on who you ask. One hundred percent. You know, what's the perfect car to you? Do you have For me? Um, <laughs> no, I don't have the perfect car. I think there's a couple of perfect. Yes, I do have the perfect car. I like. Is, is it a Tesla? It's a Tesla <laughs> Model S. Yeah, yeah. With ludicrous. Uh huh. And when the roaster comes up, when when the next yeah, it's still not my perfect car because yeah. it's it's it it can't carry, you know, more than a limited number of people. Yeah. Whereas the the Model S just does it all. Maybe no no maybe maybe I'll change my mind. Model X. So I don't know if you've seen the new again, e-tron, the Audi I e-tron. Have, I have. And do you still think that the Tesla? Yes. <laughs> it's 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 like this thing, yeah. you know, Samsung. <laughs> could come out with a spaceship. Yeah. Yeah. Unless Apple really stuffs up, iPhone's going to be my favorite phone mm. f- in, into infinity. It's perfect to you. It's right? perfect to me mm. because I fell in love with it in 2008. I got my first iPhone and I've never, I've never used another phone. Never. I don't even know what it's like. Yeah. I've, I've played around with them. Yeah. And I think they're clunky, but uh, I've never used another phone. Yeah. So, so, so for me, that happened with the electric car and Tesla. Very early on, I went to uh, the United States. Yeah. I actually got to, to get drive into one. a Tesla. And, uh, um, and it was the, the, was the whole first shame. electric vehicle I'd ever sat in. Yeah. And I think that plays a big part to falling in love with the car. 100%. Is, the, um, is, is that first experience. So, so, you know, Tesla really got to really stuff up for me to dislike them or for me to put another car. The Jaguar I-Pace comes close, mm. comes really close. I mean, that was the world car, well, the, I think the world and the South African yes. car there for a while. True, and, and it's an SUV. It's an SUV. It's yeah. an EV. So, yeah, it uh, uh, so, you know, if you, 
new to car buying and haven't made a purchase uh, in many years, it's hard to know where to start, right? 100%. Um, yeah, so. You have to assess a lot of things which meet your requirements and sometimes you don't even know what those options are, right? So let's try and unpack a couple of things. And uh, some we've, we've got three considerations here that help you find your perfect car. Uh, the first one is assess your needs. Mm-hmm. How, does, how does one assess the needs that you might have or might not have? I think you have to assess your lifestyle if you can assess your needs. So what's what are the sort of things that you need to take on your box? Do you have kids? Um, do you need multiple doors? Uh, are you off-roading? Is it just a commuter car? Yeah. How long are you going to be in it? How many people are you going to carry? Those sort of things. Um, and based on that, you are kind of closing the the entire pool of vehicles to options which you know kind of uh, match your needs. So I suppose what you're saying is that how are you going to use the car? 100%. Is, is, is the question you've got to first ask yourself. So how many passengers, like you say, um, uh, are you going to be driving highway, off road? Uh, do you need do you need a car that uh, um, that can go off road? Well, how long is your commute? Because fuel economy plays a big part. I mean, we spoke a, a couple part, of weeks yeah. ago with uh, uh, diesel engines. Yeah, it's not a good idea to drive diesel engines in short distances. Yeah. So if you're doing short distances, avoid diesels. Uh, um, you know, do you need specific functionality inside? What's your favorite technology inside a car? Uh, it's definitely the infotainment system, uh, specifically my ability to connect my Spotify to the, the sound. Yeah. Um, so some sort of Apple CarPlay or um, Android Auto, that sort of thing. Okay. Mm, and that's because everything, you know, my PlayStation's connected to my Spotify, my phone, my laptop, so it's just the infotainment system and the, the media capabilities. Do you, have, do you have an Android or an Apple device? I use both. Um, and um, Why? Well, one's for work and one's for play. Well, personal and work phone. Mm, precisely. Which one's the work phone? The Apple. Okay. Which <laughs> one? feels like propaganda. <laughs> it feels like Apple propaganda right now. Of course it is. <laughs> Of course it is. Um, they just work. Um, so, you know, a couple of other questions. I mean, my, my favorite thing is uh, um, is being able to use Apple CarPlay. Mm. That's, a, mm. that's an important feature. Mm. And uh, that's my must-have feature. It doesn't. But it, uh, getting getting the right car does trump having Apple CarPlay. Um, I think it, it depends who you ask. I have seen some research saying that a lot of younger um, audiences would actually – disregard a car completely if it doesn't have some sort of Tech. capabilities of, of connectivity. So uh, so think about if you need a, rev- a, a reverse camera or yeah. uh, as they call it overseas, a backup camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got nothing to do with backing up a computer. Uh, leather seats. Safety if you have kids. That's going to yes. play a huge you know, role. Yeah. Um, so safety like, uh, uh, what, like car, uh, um, so car seats. Capsule. The, what do you call them? Kids. Um, the 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 baby seats, baby seats, yes, that's <laughs> for baby seats. We eventually got there. <laughs> we eventually got there. Uh, you know, so sa- it's the safety features, as you say. So yeah. you know, emergency braking, lane departure, um, all those kind of. Uh, what's your favorite uh, or your 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 must have safety feature? <sighs> wow, I've actually never ever considered that before. I always just kind of assumed that the car was safe enough. Uh. Um, but for me, if it can just kind of. Like have airbags, uh-huh. uh, make sure the, the seat belts work. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell, I'll tell you a safety feature I've never more. experienced in action that I experienced a couple of weeks ago with the uh, VW e Golf. Yeah, I was uh, I was driving on a, a longish road yeah. um, behind a particular. Well, I can't remember the vehicle, and uh, he decided put on his indicator. Yeah. Okay, decided to turn. Now your brain somehow predicts the slow down rate. Yeah, of the car so, ahead of you. Yeah. Ahead of you. And yeah. you start to you start to apply pressure to the brake pedal. So I did that. I started to apply pressure. So I predicted how he was gonna turn. Yeah. What I didn't predict was that he was gonna suddenly jam on brakes before he turned. Okay. Uh, in front of me, instead yeah. of uh, he was going slow enough to do the turn, it, yeah. instead of just smoothly turning into the corner. Yeah. And he jammed on brakes because there was a curb that both of us didn't see. Yeah. And he want he didn't want to go over the curb uh, um, fa- vehicle, too yeah. fast, so he jammed on brakes. It wasn't his fault, and uh, I wasn't predicting that. The car predicted it, and what as he, he slowed down, the e Golf, uh, the VW e Golf, applied maximum brake pressure. Everything in the car flew forward. Yeah, but I missed hitting the back of him. 
And how much did that save you? You know, it's an extra, which well, I mean, saves you, you can't money, buy yeah. the e-golf, so I don't yeah. know what it would cost on it. But, but uh, it, it 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 avoided an accident. I wouldn't want to have explained to VW why I crashed their car. <laughs> yeah, one but, of six in the country. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, but that e-golf definitely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I might have been able to avoid it, but yeah. I would have had to have turned and swerved to avoid it because. But you don't have to do the thinking there. The car did it for you, right? I I wouldn't have reacted as fast as that car. Yeah. It's and always reading. Yes, exactly. So, uh, so then cargo capacity. What you know? What else? Uh, what else would you consider? Um, I don't know. Um, for my personal, uh, like the size of my garage and my driveway is not. Like, That's an important factor. Yeah. Like if I had like a huge bucky, I would struggle every single day going in and out of my driveway. So yeah. I need something that's a little bit smaller than like a double cab. Well, there's two things there. The first one is uh, 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 is the size of your parking space because yeah. as life goes on, we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller smaller living areas. Yeah. So, and the yeah. cars sometimes get bigger and bigger. Then the second feature is setting your budget. I think it's important that unless you're paying cash for the car, that you consider the financing options. They can come and bite you. If not the most important thing, I mean, these are all really important, but budget, man, um, we know how the rates are. We know how people are notoriously bad with managing their money. Mm. And with something like a vehicle, this one's important. Well, how much do you set as a budget for the car repayment? So the, the, the rule of thumb, according to Edmunds, is that your new car payment or your car payment should not exceed 15% of your monthly take-home pay. I think it's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. Uh, it, it kind of makes, uh, uh, makes a good... Um, uh, a uh, good way to look at the total cost. And then and then step number three, I would say, is weigh up the total cost of ownership. It's not only about the monthly repayment. Yeah. There's uh, so many other costs, such as petrol, like you said earlier. Insurance. Um, insurance. Wear and tear, servicing. Servicing the works. Um, accidents that might happen where you have to kind of pay ad- additional. Mm. So just think about those sort of things in terms of, you know, how much are you actually paying versus yeah. the, the price that Planned an listed. accident. Yeah, um, <laughs> I know what you mean. Imported vehicles are, are more costly to repair than yeah. uh, vehicles made. Yeah, but uh, if two cars are priced exactly the same, the uh, you know it doesn't mean that they cost the same to run. But the other uh, the other the other uh, thought is equally important, I think. And the f- and the first part of that is um, one car might be expensive up front but yeah. cheaper to run, and another car might be cheaper up front but more expensive to run. And uh, and the example I can think of is. An electric vehicle it's much more expensive up front but a lot cheaper to run in the long term yeah definitely in the long term mm. well that's all we have time for for uh you know trying to find the perfect car i don't think we've found it mine <laughs> is yet. tesla model s or model x uh so let's take a short break and when we're yeah. back we will be with martin pretorius to review the 2021 toyota land cruiser prado vxl <laughs> yeah and who knows there might be the the perfect car in his books. In his, not in mine. <laughs> See you soon. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And uh, as I mentioned, we have none other than uh, Martin Pretorius, one of our expert journalists here to review the 2021 Toyota Land Cruiser Prado VXL. Welcome, Martin. Hello, George. Thanks for having me here. You're most welcome. And uh, the 2021 Toyota Land Cruiser Prado VXL. Did I say that right? You said that perfectly correct. I th- always no, thought no it was the well. Toyota Prado. Me too. Well, VXL is just a trim level. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so entry level is TX, then mid level is VX, and yes. then VXL is the top spec one that comes with all the safety add ons like okay. adaptive screws and they keep What does VXL stand for? Uh, random letters. Very, <laughs> very, very extra large. Yeah, the, the, okay. <laughs> letters I can believe, I can believe combination. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I thought it was that uh, instead of Toyota Land Cruiser Prado, it was Toyota Prado. Uh, so land yeah. cruiser. Yeah, no, it actually so comes from the land cruiser family. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, that makes sense. Okay, so give us uh, give us your impression, your driving impression, and your uh, your opinion on this Toyota Land Cruiser Prado. I mean, the, first of all, the Land Cruiser has always been a popular car. Uh, yeah. The Prado's been a pro- popular car because you've got the short wheelbase, long wheelbase. Well, used uh, to. Used to, not yeah. anymore. Yes, exactly. They were very popular in their day. Yeah, um, very capable. You know, is this, is this, is this car going to kind of fill that gap? Well, I'm going to be totally honest. I never really understood the Prado phenomenon. 
Uh, what? Well, like in South Africa or like in, just globally? Well, in general. Yeah. Um, if you wanted a proper off-road capable SUV, you might as well just buy a Land Cruiser. But now having lived with a Prado for actually a month. Yeah. It showed me why people buy the Prado instead of the big body Land Cruiser 200. Uh, okay. It has all the same positive attributes, of but you can actually Cruiser, yeah. fit it into a normal parking space or a normal sized garage. Which what about that of a Fortuner? Does it does it not, um, why not just get a Fortuner then? Uh, Fortuner is considerably less sophisticated. Okay. Considerably less sophisticated. I mean, it actually feels downright primitive in comparison to the Prado. Wow. So, wow, wow. What, like, what features does it have that make it so... It's not so much about the features. It's about the noise insulation, the ride quality, um, okay. the general refinement when driving. The Al- almost like a Land Rover. <laughs> No, the Prado actually drives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I mean, in South Africa, it's been, it's been extremely popular yeah. um, going back years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to ask, based off- The Prado or the Land Cruiser? The Prado, specifically. Yeah. I mean, you've driven previous kind of editions of this car. Yeah. Is, this, is this a definite step up? Definitely. Um, it looks pretty much exactly as it did after the last facelift at the end of 2017. Yeah. But the important bit actually happened in the drivetrain where the Prado now finally has the new GD6 engine and mm. the six-speed auto box instead this can of find the old D4D with a five-speed. Mm. And it has, this this new combination has transformed the vehicle. It's lighter on the fuel. It's a lot nicer to drive. It's mm. quicker. It it's better on overtaking. It's huh. well, it's, more it's, a, it's it's a score on all fronts. Amazing, amazing, and uh, uh, you know any negatives about this car? Because all we're yeah. hearing is positive. It's positive, yeah. Well, <laughs> if you're interested in a car with sporty handling, yeah, this is not the car for you. Mm. However, if ninety nine percent of your driving consists of heavy traffic or freeway cruising or long distance cross country driving, this is perfect. And I'll tell you why, it has adaptive suspension, which literally smooths out whatever bumps or bottles you could throw at it. Mm. It has the ground clearance you need to mm. go literally anywhere. I mean, I actually took this thing off road along with a bunch of modified Land Rovers and <laughs> it went everywhere that they did. In standard, standard standard configuration. Standard configuration. Interesting. So it's massively capable off-road. It's beautiful and quiet and comfortable and spacious on-road. And it has one party trick that I've yet to see in another car. Uh-huh. The center console cubby yeah. is a, an armrest. It's not an armrest. It's a flipping bed. Yes, Jesus, but yeah. there's actually a fridge inside there. A proper fridge, not just some... Okay, I was going to say Land Rover, a Land Rover has the same feature. <laughs> no, this is not just some cocoonish air blowing into it. There's literally a fridge ah. built in mm. with, with the copper piping. It runs oh. off the compressor, aircon compressor. And it's so well insulated that I actually forgot after a road trip, I forgot my cool drinks in the car overnight and for the rest that for for the next day and that yeah. night i got back into the car and it, everything was still cold so it really works really really huh. well room for for a six pack mm. of soft drinks or water not beer <laughs> not drink and drive ever uh, <laughs> yes it's a, it's a seven seater right it's well, well, i mean to all the saps out there uh land cruiser uh, prado um you know look in the center console <laughs> Sorry, Toyota drivers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, price of this uh, Land Cruiser? Right. So, this top spec one I had, one point one million rand. Okay. Uh, this is the VXL. Just looked which, on Auto Trader and uh, the three liter DT VXL. I don't know if it's the same thing. No, that's the previous previous version. Yeah. It yeah. goes for a million rand. So, yeah. so one point one. And there's one really going decent. for one oh five oh. So, uh, you know, one point one for the newer spec. It's not bad. It's actually a bit of a bargain yeah. considering all the advantages. And then on top of everything else, there's an upgraded infotainment system with yeah. Android Auto and Apple and Play. Play. Mm. So there it is. you have it all. It's the perfect car. It sounds perfect almost, car. Almost. Interior. I mean, Toyota, especially the Fortuners, had this habit. I used to own a Fortuner. I love them. So don't, mm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not dissing the car, but I had this habit, and I've seen this in the Land Cruiser, of having this light interior with no option to go black. Mm. So it was, it was the same with this one. Is uh, it the kind of black? Beige, beige upholstery from the window line down. 
yeah. and black on top. And you can't go, you can't go full black. Oh, uh, you can, but then you have to settle for a TX spec and give up a whole bunch of the nice goodies that comes mm. with a VXL. If you want all the com- creature comforts, you've got to go for the light interior. The upshot is, however, the leather upholstery is extremely high in quality. Mm. Everything is very well put together. There's no rattle or squeak or yeah. shudder or anything inside the cabin. So it's very, very well screwed together. The one thing that I didn't like, believe it or not, was the wood inlays on the steering wheel at the top and so at old the school. bottom yeah. of the steering wheel. It's so yeah. old school. I thought they would have got yeah. rid of that. Mm. Yeah. So that's that that I found that really, really puzzling. But for the rest, it's extremely easy to operate and it's very again, it comes back to that to one word, comfort. This mm. car driving is your couch. perfect antidote to traffic stress. Oh, it's like me driving a Land Rover. Same <laughs> story. Sorry. <laughs> Hasn't stopped on me, but yeah, give it time. I Same just experience. cruise. It was like when I had the SRT, different story because you put your foot on the fuel of that and thing and it jumps forward. Yeah, yep. yeah. Whereas this one, it takes its time. You have to kind of drive carefully yeah, and yeah. calmly and and all that stuff. Anyway, so uh, uh, Martin, your score out of ten, I'd give it eight and a half. Part eight and a half. I thought you loved this car. I loved it. I loved it. The problem is the price tag is still a little bit steep ah, for my okay. liking. Okay. Um, it carries about a 25% price premium over an equivalently equipped uh, Fortuner. Mm. And I'm not sure that it's actually 25% better than a Fortuner. Okay, so the other cars or car that uh, got an 8.5 from our expert journalist was the BMW 4 Series 420D. Mm-hmm. Very different car, but also scored an 8.5. Cars that have outscored the Toyota Land Cruiser Prado is the Toyota Hilux Legend. Yeah, it has got a nine. Uh, the Mercedes Benz AMG A Class 835, which has got a nine, and the Suzuki Vitara Brezza, which has got a nine. What do you think of that? Well, I haven't driven the Brezza yet. Yes. Um, the other two I can understand. You can? Yes. Okay. Well, especially because I gave the BMW 420D that 8.5 out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you, uh, 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 so you, you, you're happy with your 8.5 score in that yeah. case. And um, uh, well, so a, there, there you have it. Yeah. Just one question. So, well, more of a comment. I see that the lower spec TX is actually... About 200,000 cheaper than this one. Yes. So serious value for money. Serious value for money. You and you up. get the same brilliant diesel engine yeah. with TX spec as well. So if you can do with the, the safety fridge? add-ons <laughs> and all the other nice things. Do you get the fridge? You still get you the still fridge. You still get the fridge. Okay. <laughs> so yes, the fridge is there. buy a TX. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you has everything you need. 200 grand for a fridge. For fridge. <laughs> Okay, well, that's all we have time for, uh, unfortunately. Thank you very much, our expert journalist, Martin Pretorius, for coming in and giving us the uh, rundown of the 2021 Toyota Land Cruiser Prado VXL. Sounds like a beautiful car to drive, uh, you know, and I'm pretty sure that Martin was gutted to give it back. I was. <laughs> Great stuff. Yeah. And uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to answer your burning questions from our Ask Auto Trader platform. Thanks again, Martin. See you next time. Thanks, George. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Martin. And uh, welcome back. That was a very interesting review by uh, mm, Martin of definitely. the 2021 Toyota Land Cruiser Prado VXL. Uh, sounds like a car that I want to I want to drive. I, I prefer the comfortable cars lately. I would like to see how it goes up against the Fortuner. Um, mm. And I'm not sure what the price point is of, of the Fortuner, but... I don't know if you can you compare, know, hey? You don't think so? No, it's a different car. Completely. Completely different car. Yeah, it's, well, it seems complete. Um, and for that price, it's definitely something you should consider mm. if you're in the market. It's like comparing a Tesla with a Golf Chica. <sighs> yeah, this propaganda continues. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so uh, every everyday people send auto traders some motoring related questions about all things car buying and car selling. Yeah. So uh, Wandy and I have uh, now uh, pulled out, Wandy has pulled out uh, some questions, the burning questions that you have. And um, Wandy, what's the first question? First question comes from Gamogelo who's asking, how trustworthy are the small dealerships that are an auto trader? Well, uh, Kamachelo, that's like asking, uh, you know, whether you should trust a short person or a tall person. Mm. Um, you know, it depends. Yeah, you know, the, 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 there's no such thing as putting a trust stamp on a small dealership or a large dealership. Yeah. You know, they could easily 
equally be trustworthy or untrustworthy yeah. depending on their own behaviors. Um, so, you know, at the time of the listing, um, we do our best to- Kind of do diligence, to, yeah. Do, you know, at the time that the, the customer comes on board, we do our best to try and do uh, some due diligence around, um, you know, what, what kind of a dealership are they? Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, and they, are they good for the, for the consumer by and large? Um, what they do in the background, we can't vet. We can't- yeah check up on them all the time in terms of their behavior, what type of service they give, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so your best bet, Kamachelo, is always, 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 always go and check at what the public says. Yeah. Go onto Facebook, go and see if there are reviews. Go onto Hello Peter, see if there are uh, uh, reviews. And then uh, for your own peace of mind, go to audertrader.co.za forward slash safety dash and dash security, our safety and security page. And there's some hints as to yeah. you know what uh, or, or guidelines that you that that might you might find find useful. Yeah. So uh, so the short answer is, I know a lot of small dealerships who are very trustworthy. Yeah, um, just about as trustworthy as any big, and big ones who are, are less trustworthy. similarly yeah. probably not trustworthy either. Yeah. So you know so don't 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 put trust stamp on size, size yeah. i don't think it's i don't think it's fair next question good advice second question comes from Veli leo's asking i work as a health professional um can i buy a car with just a proof of appointment letter so they don't have a pay slip um they just have the the proof of appointment unfortunately um Valeli, how do you say her name Valile. Valile. Yes. yes there we go sorry about that uh, Valile. unfortunately a letter of appointment is not going to survive uh, yeah. suffice. So fi financial institutions need this to know the state of your finances, probably will ask for bank statements and verify your income mm. um, more than just looking at a payslip or a uh, um, letter of appointment. So mm. letter of appointment doesn't mean um, that you have been paid that money for the last exactly. couple of months. So yeah. so I don't, think, uh, I don't think that will suffice, no. In your opinion, how long do you think um, she should wait? Until well, a couple of months. Uh, I think banks now ask for three or six months of bank statement. Okay, um, you so know, it's so a little while. Yeah, wait a couple of months and uh, make sure you got a clean credit record. Next question. Last question um, comes from Etienne, who's asking: Please tell me if it's legal or ethical for dealers to still advertise vehicles without VAT. Um, you know, I think we've addressed this question before, but yeah, let's uh, let's visit it again. And that is, um, uh, the, there. Dealers can't, according to our rules at Auto Trader, can't yeah. list vehicles exclusive of VAT. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, the VAT Act, to my knowledge, uh, does make mention of the fact that if a price is VAT exclusive, you've got to say that it's VAT exclusive. Yeah. We don't provide the ability for a dealer to make that claim. Yeah, I mean, it's literally tens of thousands of vehicles yes. on a daily basis on the on um, the on the site. So, yeah. what it, it doesn't mean that dealers won't attempt to list the vehicle without VAT and try and put the descript in the description the fact that it's exclusive, mm. but we discourage it and uh, and we don't allow it. Yeah, if you see a vehicle that is listed with uh, exclusive of VAT in the description, please send it to us so that we can address it with that particular dealer because it's not part of our business practice. Yeah. So to say whether it's ethical or legal, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't think that's the right question. It, Auto Traders rules are every price. On, listed on order trader should be listed inclusive of that because we don't make provision for the ability to make mention of yeah. a price being listed exclusive of that. That's Great. the short answer. Kind of going back to um, the first segment that we had, once again, don't think that the price that you see is the total cost of, of, of ownership. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Well, that's all we have time for, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and my name is George Meany, your host, and I've been joined by Wendy Lessie Share. It's been epic. See you next time. Sounds good.